Hi, Kidlets. This is your very last lecture before your exam on Monday. Um, this should be pretty darn easy for you to get through. Um, big picture items here are your radio astronomy, significant difference, differences between radio astronomy and optical astronomy, and some of the major missions. So remember that radio waves are physically longer. So we can see if we just take a look at the size, a centimeter to a, mil to a meter, um, that's pretty big. And you can also have um, significantly longer radio waves as well because you can see that the radio band takes up a pretty big chunk of the electromagnetic spectrum. So it's almost half. And these waves, I mean, you know those units, whereas the rest are all in nanometers. So that's physically measurable. So they, me they penetrate Earth's atmosphere and they can be observed from the ground. So we have a radio window here, and here's our visual window. Here's our partial infrared window. And then we have a partial UV window as well. So radio telescopes do not look like traditional telescopes at all. Um, they have no sort of focal tube, no eyepiece. In fact, they look just like a satellite dish because radio waves are so long, you have to have a dish that is collecting the energy. This doesn't give you a physical picture. Um, this would be collecting um, thermal imagery and sounds from the universe. This would give a signal. This wouldn't necessarily give a picture, but the signal would, would get stored and converted into images and spectra. So you can see that these dishes, you've got um, your amplifier right here, and it looks just like a satellite dish, and it would then rotate. So one of the major benefits of something like this is this can run 24 hours a day. This is unaffected by any sort of weather. It's unaffected by day or night. So whereas optical telescopes can only run at night, they're really limited in terms of weather. And if you think about the locations that most optical telescopes are located on top of mountains, they're going to be exposed to severe weather. They're going to have severe thermal differences. There's going to be snow, um, even on top of Mauna Kea and Hawaii, whereas radio telescopes are completely unaffected by that. So the largest radio telescope is called Arecibo. Um, this is 300 meters. This is actually built, it's pretty neat actually, there is a natural limestone cave. This is called karst topography for any of you into geology, I am. Um, and this is a natural area of caves. So this was a natural limestone cave that this is embedded into. So you can see the amplifier is here. It's suspended above by these towers. So it's called Arecibo. Um, you could physically go and visit it. You can see all the roads around. That is on my bucket list. Um, here is another pretty large one, 100 meters. So since the wavelengths are so long, they have to be built significantly bigger. So this is 100 meters. This is in Green Bank, West Virginia. So you can see that it pivots on this point here. So we have that partial atmospheric window for infrared. So we can observe some near infrared at certain places in the atmosphere. And for our far infrared, that would have to be done from space. So we have our NASA infrared telescope in Mauna Kea. So this is pretty high up. Um, so here you can see the dome. So again, that would only be open at night, whereas your radio telescopes are unaffected by day night. Here is Sophia, the flying stratospheric um, infrared observatory, which by the way, I tonight, just tonight got the email that I did not get in. I'm, I'm quite upset. So is Miss Broche. Um, if you have her, please uh, give her your condolences. So the benefit of something like Sophia, which is the plane, is that since most uh, infrared is absorbed in the lower atmosphere, if you get high enough, so high enough on the mountains, or a plane flying high enough, you can still get, you can still detect um, some of that infrared, so where that, that partial transparency is. Um, infrared has to be, since this is detecting um, thermal imagery, so you're seeing really the heat sources in the galaxy or wherever it is you're looking, um, all of that equipment can also uh, contaminate the image. So there's things like uh, thermal noise from the electronics, which can make the edges of images look kind of blurry. Um, it can end up distorting the images. So they have to keep the equipment really, really cool. And the only thing that can do that is liquid nitrogen, keeping it as close to absolute zero as possible. So the really expensive observatories and even things like Hubble would have liquid nitrogen on board to keep the equipment cool to not distort the imagery. And then we have Hubble, the HST. This is one of our great observatories along with Chandra and Spitzer. Uh, Hubble, and then the other is the, the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory. So Hubble is pretty cute. 
Um, its predecessor is going to be the James Webb Telescope. So this image is um, not just visual, although its visual imagery is what it's best known for, but what Hubble does is it overlays multiple images um, with multiple different filters in order to see, um, to really get a picture of what the image is. So being that it's above the atmosphere, you don't have that turbulence. So stars observed by Hubble would not twinkle. Um, so here we can see the uh, visual image of Mars. We can clearly see the auroras and the polar caps. Um, this is a red giant star that is expelling its outer layer of gases. If you were to go into the West Ranch Library, you would also see this imagery along the spine of all of the encyclopedias. Um, here, and these are all visual. This is not any other wavelength, um, is the Andromeda Galaxy. Um, so what Hubble images is in the not just visible, but infrared and also UV, and it would overlay all of those imageries to get um, a really clear picture. And here you can see the ionized layer of the atmosphere. So Spitzer is another one of the great observatories. Um, Spitzer specifically looks at infrared. Um, it's looking at far infrared. Um, Spitzer is a really neat observatory. It gives us some really amazing pictures. So Spitzer is only an infrared observatory. If we get to go to JPL, which I'm still working on, um, last year we got to speak with, well, he spoke to us, um, one of the project leads for the Spitzer telescope. And it, it was really neat. He showed us a lot of the pictures that Spitzer took. And then my personal favorite is Voyager. So there were two Voyager satellites. There was Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. Um, both of these were launched in 1977 and pretty spectacular. They had to calculate where the positions of all of the outer planets were because each of those used gravitational slingshots, not um, rocket fuel, in order to um, move to the outer edges of the solar system. So here is what Voyager looks like. When we go to JPL, you'll see these scale models of Voyager. So the older missions and satellites were much bigger. If you were to see Spitzer, Spitzer would be just a tiny little blip. It is far smaller than Voyager. Voyager is pretty big. So Voyager 2 was looking at the outer planets. Still to this day, the only imagery we have of Pluto, of Neptune, and of Uranus is all from Voyager 2, from the 80s, which was when it got there. We don't have any other images from it. Um, so Voyager 1 is considered to be interstellar as of 2012. It has officially left the heliosphere, which means it is beyond the magnetic field of the sun. Um, it is still within our solar system because it is now in the Oort cloud. Um, the Oort cloud is this region um, beyond the orbit of Pluto where there is a bunch of other um, solar system remnants, lots of comets, probably an additional eight planets or so that have been expelled from the universe, or not universe, sorry, solar system. Um, here you can see the beautiful imagery of Saturn's rings. Now Cassini is around Saturn. Here we can see the first um, close-up images we ever had of Jupiter's uh, great red spot. Three Earths would fit inside that. It's equivalent to like a terrestrial hurricane. And the coolest thing about Voyager is this guy, the golden record. I really encourage you guys to look up the golden record and see it. It has messages for um, any potential extraterrestrial beings that were to find this. So remember, this is the 70s. Their um, music technology was a record, and it's actually got a picture here of a record player. So it tells the person who found it, or the being that finds it, how to construct a record player and how to play it. Um, the image got cut off here, but there's a picture of a man and a woman. There's a picture of our genetic code. shows that we're carbon-based, and it shows our location in the universe as well. It shows where the, the Milky Way is, where the sun is, and that we are the third planet from the sun. So it actually gives directions of how to find us. So here are some Voyager images of Saturn. So you can see how pretty Saturn looks here. You can see that since it's a gas planet, it's actually flattened on the top of the bottom. Jupiter is as well. So here's many of Saturn's moons. And that's looking at it from behind Mars. So this is before uh, Voyager um, had crossed Mars's orbit. CCD imaging. Um, a CCD is a charged coupled device. And uh, this is something that is used in every telescopic imagery program in order to give us these beautiful pictures. So um, whereas we used to use things like photographic plates, um, this is the, the technology that is also used in your cell phones. So what this does is this uh, collects pixels. If you think about a pixel as being like a miniature little cup, and if your camera is like, say, eight megapixels, that would mean that you have all of these little mini cups that are collecting photons 
photons fall in. They're then read out however many um, each little pixel has. So a pixel is short for picture element. Um, and this technology was invented for observing really dark objects because when we're looking out in space, most of it is dark, empty space. And we want to image these faint objects. So this is, again, why all of the equipment has to be cooled with liquid nitrogen that kept at a really low temperature um, to be able to make sure that the detector, that the CCD, is picking up light from this and not from the equipment. Um, because it would actually blur and you can actually even see a little bit in this image um, that you can't see much along the edges that's probably from um, from the the, uh, the blurring from the electronics itself so this is the sombrero galaxy so we have infrared here and um, visible in this guy so um, what this does is it allows the data to be read so however many pixels or however many photons are in a pixel um, it would be counted and obviously the brighter areas like here would have more photons than the outer areas so that you have it given given a numerical display in order to make it so it would look like this so if you were to think about something that looked like this image right here initially you just had a series of numbers so where there's a zero that means there were zero photons that were hitting that so here is an array um, I'm not sure how big this array is, but it would be however many pixels are this direction by however many pixels are this direction. That's only a millimeter. So you can see this is very small, similar to what's in your cell phone. Um, this is the array where it's read out. So they would all come down this line and be read out here and totaled. And this happens instantaneously. This does this multiple times per second. So here we can see in the center, we've got six pixels, seven pixels moving out. We've got one, and then we have another series of numbers here. So that would indicate that the brighter part of the image is in the center where you have more numbers. So that means those areas collected um, more photons. So that's called the photoelectron effect. This is actually what Einstein was looking at. So where he talked about E equals MV squared, that a photon can be converted and have the same um, energy as an electron. So that photon is read out as an electron right here. It's converted so they have the same sort of effect. That's called the photoelectron effect. Um, that a photon and electron have the same energy and can be treated um, inter interchangeably. So here's some adaptive optics. So um, computers can sharpen those images. So here we can see this is all the same picture looked at um, through different filters from computers. This is all in the, in the visual, but using computers to sharpen those images. So radio interferometry um, is a way to uh, resolve images from radio telescopes um, that are using, again, these really long wavelengths because since uh, the resolution of a telescope um, is a function of its diameter, when you have such long wavelengths here, um, it becomes really tough to resolve a radio image um, because the radio waves are so much longer than visible light. So what they do is they combine the signals from multiple different dishes um, in order to resolve those images. So remember the resolving power. So in order to see the smallest thing, you would have this simple equation. And again, that's supposed to be lambda, which is your wavelength. So the longer the wavelength you get, the more poor your resolving power. You can see things that are, you can't see things that are as close together. So, um, so this process is called interferometry. So radio telescopes are, with the exception of Arecibo, not just single entities. They would exist in a whole array, just like a CCD would, where you have multiple um, little pixels that are collecting photons. Uh, with interferometry, you just have multiple dishes that are aligned. So it's just like when you have something like a radio map, it's the same sort of concept. So here is an example of the very large array. Again, an uh, example of the the creativity of astronomers and choosing names. Um, but what they have is these 27 dishes that are combined together to simulate a large dish 36 kilometers in diameter. So you can see the array here. So then we have, um, I think that one is actually the very long baseline array. Again, very creative. Um, and then here is another area where you have a bunch of them and then the signals would be combined together. So there are a few remaining slides um, looking at Hubble and some images taken by Hubble. An example of the Mauna Kea telescope where you can see this is an international effort. Every, a bunch of different countries have different areas here. So these are ours and that one. 
and a very large telescope in Atacama. So this is on top of a um, desert mountain, um, and you can see all of the different systems they have here. Um, and then here would be the dome that opens. So um, the take home here and the things that I'm hoping you um, leave this lecture with would be your different uh, observatories. So Voyager, Hubble, Spitzer, and Arecibo. And then also the big differences between radio astronomy and optical and what CCDs are, what they do, and how they help astronomy. I will see you guys on Monday.